Welcome to the Racial Equity Roundtable Information Session for the 2021-2022 Cross-Sector Cohort Programming. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us bright and early on a Friday morning. Um, we have quite a bit of information for you. Um, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, we'll share some about Forward Through Ferguson's why, why we're doing this work um, and why we're welcoming you to the table. We'll share some information about the roundtable itself, um, some details on how to apply, then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, this meeting is being recorded. It should have alerted you when you came in. We'll record until the end of the Q&A and then we'll stop recording and we'll do an interactive session with you to hear from you about your visions for racial equity in St. Louis. Um, so let's get started. Um, as we, uh, David and I are gonna introduce ourselves, um, we, we found pretty quickly that storytelling um, and getting to know people and building relationships in that way is a, is a really crucial foundation for the work. So we'll share some about ourselves. And as we're doing that, please share about yourself in the chat um, and then we'll dig in. All right. So this is the Racial Equity Capacity Building Team. We are a small but mighty team um, and we'll be um, bringing on a new fellow soon that I'm very excited about. Um, Paper Hempel is our fantastic director of racial equity capacity. She could not be here today. Um, and I can't speak for her or tell her story, but I can share that she's an incredible leader. Um, she has a deep history in St. Louis, a deep history in education, in um, K through 12 education, as well as adult learning um, and the region at large. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be learning with and from her. Um, she's been crucial about me moving along my path to racial equity. So my name is Sarah Murphy. I serve as a racial equity support catalyst at Forward Through Ferguson. And I'm from St. Louis. I was born in Clayton. And as a white woman in St. Louis in Clayton, um, I grew up with, with all of the, the privileges that that affords. But my parents were not um, from St. Louis. They were transplants and um, worked in science in the Monsanto track of chemical and uh, my mom in higher education. So um, as white people in the, in the 80s, they were able to buy a home in Clayton in an excellent school district. Um, they were able to navigate that system, which set me up um, for success in the region. And I've benefited from all of the structural realities that uh, racial inequity, <clears throat> excuse me, sets up. And I've also been the kind of kid who um, asks questions about why. I would notice things be like, that doesn't quite make sense. Why is St. Louis this way? Why is it, why is there a, a fear among my, my friends' parents maybe about going to the loop? <laughs> or, you know, why, why are these cultural things the way they are? And so that, late, that line of thinking set me up um, throughout my higher education and throughout my graduate education to be asking questions about inequity. Um, and so through my path, um, I ended up back in St. Louis and um, when Michael Brown was killed by Darren Wilson in 2014, um, I began a line of inquiry about racial inequity in the education system that led me to think about policy, to led me, led me to think about systemic change. Um, and so fast forward now, I'm working with Ford to Ferguson because I'm committed to thinking about how we across our different silos and in different sectors can work together um, to really lift the region up to meet its potential, to, for everyone to meet their potential. So um, with that, <laughs> I will hand it over to David to tell us a little bit more about his story. Thanks, Sarah. And good morning, everyone. Really great to be with you. Thanks for spending some of your Friday with us. Um, so my name is David Dwight IV. I'm the Lead Strategy Catalyst and Executive Director at Ford through Ferguson. Um, I've been in this role now for about two years, um, but have been with the organization um, since it started five years ago. Um, so some of my St. Louis stories that I've, I've lived here for about a decade. So I'm a transplant, um, came here for school and was originally studying engineering actually um, before Michael Brown was killed, uh, right before my senior year of college. Um, and those events as well as the uprising that happened across St. Louis really drove me to get involved, um, helped to form a student organizing collective um, that had chapters at eight different campuses across the region called St. Louis Students in Solidarity. Um, and from there, I um, had the opportunity to meet one of the Ferguson commissioners um, and then join on after I graduated with the staff as a communications um, fellow. 
um, and uh, also worked really closely staffing the Civilian Law Enforcement Relations Working Group and helping to, to write the, the final report. Um, and then when there was that call um, to make sure that there was some kind of ongoing infrastructure for this work in the region uh, on that path to racial equity, some kind of accountability partner that could help the region to, to try, try and try again um, on these really stubborn disparities. Uh, I got to join with Krishma Furtado and Nicole Hudson as founding staff of Ford the Ferguson um, and met Fabra when she was doing um, some incredible racial equity director work at City Garden Montessori. Um, and not only did she positively influence that community, but Faber was also really um, crucial in a collaborative, collaborative that had over 700 people go through anti-bias, anti-racism uh, training in St. Louis. So we're really, really thankful to have her wisdom on the team. So when we uh, start these presentations, we always really like to center our why. Um, so as many of you know, uh, the work of Ford through Ferguson um, began uh, with the Ferguson Commission, as I just mentioned. Um, this was a body of 16 volunteer community members who spanned all sectors and belief systems across the region, um, but who were brought together um, by Governor Nixon at the time after the murder of Michael Brown Jr. in Ferguson. Um, and so the commission really took up the call to confront and engage with the deep community pain that was on display as especially young people of color were saying, no more, um, we're gonna be in these streets um, and, and in that uprising that followed. And, and so while the commission um, is named for the events in Ferguson, we all know that the root causes um, and these racial disparities in question are in no way isolated to one uh, municipality uh, in North St. Louis, but is a regional issue um, that affects every single municipality um, and every municipality has a role in writing um, the harms that have been caused across time. And so the commission held over 70 uh, public meetings uh, incorporating the insights of over 3000 community members it was one of the largest uh, public design processes that have ever happened in St. Louis. Um, and those 3000 community members and leaders put in over 30,000 volunteer hours towards the creation of the Ferguson Commission Report. And so that commission process made it abundantly clear that for decades, our siloed systems in St. Louis had allowed and were still allowing racial equity to fall through the cracks. And so the commission produced 189 policy calls to action to start changing those systems and to, to close those cracks. Um, and we've really taken to saying when people remark on, okay, 189, it's a lot of calls to action, that really there's one central call to action from the Ferguson Commission. And that's that every St. Louisan organization in all their spaces, places, and spheres of influence has to deal with our deep racial inequities. Um, and here's some data, some research, some community storytelling, and 189 first steps to, to do that. 189 uh, ways to get in where you fit in. Um, and so those um, that, that study from the, the commission really looked widely and saw that St. Louis um, had, first of all, often greater disparities than the rest of the nation, um, comparable urban regions. And we also had disparities that got worse over time. So we can see these medium household wealth um, indicators where the gap in wealth um, for black and white households have actually increased over time. We see these uh, home ownership rates where for black and Latinx families, um, it's largely stayed the same in the last 50 years, whereas it's increased by 6% for, for white St. Louisans. Um, and we also see an incarceration rate where uh, the gap has only widened um, with the with a crisis of how we use the carceral state against people of color. Um, we also see this in the education space. This is a collection of um, whisker plots from, from our recent report um, that just shows that on average majority white districts receive more funding per district than majority black districts. And they also are able to then spend more money per student than majority black districts, which can have really big effects then on the education quality and experience for, for, for our kids across districts. 
not because there's not brilliant people in those districts, but because they're faced with a whole set of social and systemic challenges because of this history of racial inequity. And so we see AP classes at a three to one rate um, in white districts versus majority black districts. Um, we see that in, in algebra classes too, and, and we see it in calculus classes where um, this kind of key course for a, for a lot of opportunity post high school um, is not failed to offer, all majority white districts offer it, and many majority black districts are, are not able to. And so we always, always, always start with how this directly impacts people of color. Um, and we would be remiss if we did not also include that ultimately racial inequities make the entirety of the St. Louis region a less thriving place um, to live in. Um, this is one study um, that found that years ago it was $14 billion that we were leaving off on the table for our economy. And these days it's as much as $17 billion. And that was in 2016. Uh, it has only grown across time. Um, and it's about time that we that we reverse these trends. And so Ford through Ferguson um, was born at the end of the commission and that vocal community desire that the momentum had to continue from that process and to really ensure that that report didn't just gather dust on a shelf. Um, and so uh, quick, uh, many of you have likely seen this definition um, which we've used since the commission times, but we define it as a St. Louis where a person's life outcomes cannot be predicted by race. So that's a very outcome driven statement but then there's a process element to it as well, right? When our regional systems, whether they're education, housing, healthcare, jobs, transportation, on and on, work well for all people so that these disparities are closed and all residents, regardless of race or their zip code that they're born in, have justice and the opportunity to thrive. And so how do we operationalize that, right? Um, the commission said, here's a path, but figure out how to get down that path. And so in our work with hundreds of partners um, and in talking with hundreds and thousands of St. Louisans across different advocacy um, partnerships that we've done, um, we really started to solidify on these set of three action strategies to live into that mission. And that's to advocate for policy and systems change, build racial equity capacity, which you all are here to be part of uh, that work to build a culture and practice of equity. So thanks for showing up this morning. Um, and then also to uh, make sure that we're generating the human and financial capital for this work so that we can do this generational work. You know, racial inequities weren't created uh, in a few years. They were created since the founding of this country. And so it's gonna take more than a couple of years to right all of those wrongs, but that doesn't mean there's not urgent things that we do today. And we believe um, that if we can invest fully in these things, as well as making sure we have the heart set for the work, because um, how we show up matters, then we can achieve a St. Louis, a generation after the killing of Michael Brown, where racial equity is a reality. Um, and so the Racial Equity Roundtable is part of that build racial equity capacity strategy. Um, and the goals of it are to cultivate and activate leaders to facilitate that long-term change, and also to find ways for us to measure progress and amplify progress. Thank you, David. So yeah, if you've read the Ferguson Commission report, you know that, or you might be familiar with this framing of what it is and what it isn't. And so we like to uh, set up clear expectations that Ford through, Ford through Ferguson does not operate as a diversity and equity or diversity and inclusion trainer or practitioner. Um, we were created to carry forth the community insight and vision of the Ferguson Commission, which identified the need for defining the path for individuals and institutions in the region to move from awareness of racial inequities to transformational action that eventually eliminate those inequities. And so Ford through Ferguson acts as a wayfinder. So we are not a replacement for diversity, equity, and inclusion trainers, um, but we are here to create a container that you come to the table and we can catalyze the thinking about what you need to do in your lane and offer opportunities for learning to move towards transformational action. So we define Wayfinder. We help people and institutions find their starting point. Um, we help you strategize for the journey forward for, to create next practices and discover how to be a radically accountable partner in systems change. And so in doing that, we help you def define a plan of action and then troubleshoot with partners within your sector and across your sector to think about the next best step forward, as well as helping you um, find the tools and the trainers and the models um, that will support you in doing so successfully. 
And so uh, where we reference the path to racial equity, we're talking about this model. And so Ford through Ferguson developed this model um, to express key elements of our theory of change. So um, we as members of the St. Louis region were on this path to racial equity together um, that we need to focus on levels of being an individual, of being a member of an institution and what uh, institutions need to be working on as well as the region at large. And so we are all parts of interworking and interrelated systems um, and our roles and our awareness, um, our understanding and our capacity for transformation may be at different places depending on the uh, area that we are talking about. But, but before we can transform the region, um, towards equity, we must first move through the stages of awareness of the inequities themselves at each level. Then through the process of learning and unlearning, um, we deepen our understanding of why they exist. And then with that grounding, we can take informed action to try to transform things towards equity. So each stage is crucial. And we so often wanna to jump towards action, you know, or action oriented people, we care, we wanna do things. And because of the highly complex and deeply entrenched nature of racial inequity, of systemic racism, of racial capitalism, we find ourselves, if we jump towards action without first building shared awareness and deepening our understanding of the issues, we can unintentionally perpetuate harm or deepen inequities um, when, where our intention is different. Um, but also we wanna note that even as you move through them, this is linear because it's a model, it's a, <laughs> it's a graphic, but um, it can certainly be cyclical. So you can be um, aware, deeply aware of something, you can understand it, you can be working towards transformation and something pops up and you realize, oh, here's a whole nother layer I'm not aware of. And so we offer this to say that that's a part of the process. Um, and as we move along it, the more we're aware of these stages, the more conscientiously we can be doing this work. So that's some about the grounding of these offerings and um, the Building Racial Equity Capacity Team offers some workshops that I see some familiar faces from those workshops. Um, and But you can get in where you fit in at any point. Today, we're talking about the Racial Equity Roundtable. Um, but if you would like to check out all of the offerings, please go to this link, the bit.ly 2021RE in the chat um, and share it with your colleagues about different sizes and, and shapes of getting into the work. But for today, we'll talk about the roundtable. So this is our third iteration of the Racial Equity Roundtable back by popular demand. Um, it's been so incredible to see it grow over time and for the model and impact of it to also evolve each time with feedback from the members. So we're really excited to bring this 3.0 version that brings with it two layers of deepening and improvement um, from the past few years. So what do you actually, what are the components of this, this round table? So it's a monthly membership across 10 months that starts in July of this year and continues into 2022. And it has four main components to it. So first up is around case study creation. So each participating institution completes a guided individualized racial equity case study that it examines its own organizational history, its current, the current landscape that it faces, Bases, excuse me, as well as strengths and challenges. Then uh, from there, second, this, this round table also includes resource generation. So these institutional case studies um, and the discussion that follows it with your peers will then be synthesized to generate new knowledge, new approaches, and also new tools for round table members to leverage and support their work um, actively in their institutions. And Third, it brings with it intergroup dialogue, which we found to be incredibly valuable for members because often being a catalyst for racial equity within small and large institutions can be an isolating experience and faces a ton of barriers to deconstruct and reconstruct um, these policies, practices, and cultures. And so we really heard, um, and this was the reason for the first round table, was that there, we needed to create communities where people could problem solve together <clears throat> and build their confidence together to attack these issues. 
And so this intergroup dialogue piece of it is, is that at the monthly roundtable uh, sessions, there are discussions that include reflections on uh, targeted readings, dialogue on racial equity topics that are specific to the fields of the organizations that are there. Um, and the FTF facilitators will also hold um, affinity and caucusing groups um, to also support some of that racial or that, yeah, that racial identity development of the individuals. Um, lastly, community building. So while the roundtables provide space for shared learning um, about foundational racial equity work, there's also a really intentional focus on cultivating trust, building meaningful relationships that will last beyond just the 10 month roundtable, which we are really glad to see happened with the roundtable that actually just ended two days ago. Um, with the last cohort, they're, they're so excited to stay in touch with their pairs and their, and their group. Um, that it really does cultivate that trust, build meaningful relationships and strategize the practice of radical collaboration across leaders. Um, so here's a quote from one of the participants um, in this last round table. The racial equity round table has given us the chance to further operationalize our commitments. The content that was shared throughout has been thought provoking and super applicable. So that testimonial is one example of what you'll get, but we wanted to break down a little bit more about your committing to this 10 month process and what are the outcomes that you can expect? What are the outcomes that we commit to uh, cultivating the opportunity for you to get? Um, and so we think about leadership development really as um, a core component of it, where we try to create a, a responsive curriculum that leverages anti-bias, anti-racist, and systems change strategies. So you as leaders can take the, the, all the experience that you come to the table with and plug it into um, the opportunities in the curriculum that we offer so you can develop your skills and think about what you can try um, in your situations um, in your respective lanes. Um, and at the end of each session, we request that you fill out a uh, reflection form and it, what we we call formative assessments so that we can hear from you about what's working and what could work better for you. Um, and so we, be, we are flexible in that way and uh, tailor what we offer in each session to the group's needs. As the cohort grows and changes together, um, you develop a community practice like David was just talking about where um, through the in-depth case studies and uh, the participating institutions offer up problems of practice. And over time, we build trust together so that you can really um, be radically honest with each other about things that are coming up and think about how in the things that feel like failures in your institutions, you can learn from them and try something else, right? We have to iterate to implement and try new things um, or we just remain stagnant. So that community of practice and problem solving is one uh, crucial thing that you'll get out of it. That also, we've heard that that also helps um, folks grow muscles to be able to do that with their colleagues as well. So in uh, testing it out in the round table, then you can take those skills back to your teams. Um, we do a baseline and a growth assessment at the first and last session. So we ask each, um, participant to evaluate key aspects of racial equity operations in your organization. So you'll be able to see the impact of the program over time. And um, also the we've heard that the initial assessment starts to get your wheels turning about what does operationalizing racial equity really mean? And then over time, we, we support you in creating action plans then to where at the beginning, you may not have a lot of the elements of it to then start building them into your organization. And like David said, a crucial part, the glue that holds it all together um, and holds the region together moving this work forward is this um, accountable, radically collaborative network of organizational leaders in St. Louis. So folks who are dedicated to breaking down the silos that currently exist and build both new muscles for themselves and new systems in their organizations um, that we really need in the region to achieve racial equity together. So one more um, testimonial from a participant um, who said that the roundtable has helped us in thinking through and working to establish continued ongoing practices to habitualize and establish expectations of centering racial equity in both our individual behavior and our organizational work. Love hearing that. So how do you apply? Um, if this all sounds interesting, um, what next? We'll go over some key points and then run through the application itself um, before we open up for questions. All right, so 
Um, just a quick overview. So the um, to be eligible, we ask uh, two representatives come per institution and that they commit um, to coming to the um, at least 80% of the sessions. And so we ask that those two representatives be someone who has um, policy influence. So someone who is in leadership circles and who can um, be at the tables that are making organizational institutional um, plans, people who have influence over budgets <laughs> and who can take what we're learning and build it into the organization. And then we think about somebody with key cultural influence who's maybe somebody in your institution who people go to for advice, who people naturally trust or have, has built trust over a long period of time to think about um, how we can shift the culture and the policies of your organization to support moving towards racial equity. Um, the application is due by March 26th. Um, here's, thank you, David, for dropping the um, bit.ly link in the chat to the application itself. Um, it's a PDF that you can download and then send back to us via email. Um, partnerships or organizations from the same sector are highly encouraged to apply together to think about where there's some seeds of collaboration or some already existing systems of collaboration that we can strengthen and work together. Um, and we um, invite folks across sectors um, to join. So you don't need to be applying with a partner. We just say that um, to, so that you're thinking about teamwork. Um, and so membership fees are on a sliding scale by sector. We'll go over that in the application. Um, it's detailed thoroughly, but um, wanted to note that there are limited scholarships available on a case-by-case -case basis. So if when you see the table, it seems out of reach for you, um, please, please don't hesitate to reach out and, and we can talk. All right, so then let's switch over to the application itself. So you may have already clicked on the link um, and seen this beautifully designed PDF of um, the application for the roundtable. And so much of the background that we went through is outlined here in narrative. So if we spoke too fast for you, don't panic. Um, this video is being recorded so you can watch it again. And so much of it is um, outlined in narrative here. It overviews our core principles, as well as some history of the purpose of the round table um, with a quote from one of our founding designers, um, architects and uh, key collaborators, Dr. Kara Hudson Banks. A little bit more of the history and some key links. So we do ask that, um, you know, we went over the path to racial equity. The round table is really for everyone who is in this awareness stage. So by being here, we see that you are um, you're in the awareness stage by making the choice to come today. You've already taken um, a key step. Some of you have taken workshops. So we ask that before you come to the round table that you read the 2039 action plan, as well as some other um, resources that are listed here. Went over the, goes over the key components and some more details about eligibility. And so, yeah, as I said, we were really, um, we find it most effective when um, the people that come to the table are folks who are in institutional leadership, um, that, that there is some um, commitment already demonstrated about moving forward along the path to racial equity so that what you're doing um, at the round table then isn't just happening in the round table silo that you bring it back um, to your organization and that there is at least some degree of openness to really integrating it into um, the workings of the organization. Also, David, feel free to jump in at any point <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm rushing by something too fast. Um, so we ask you to send a team of two. Um, and in that team of two, we do ask that um, if possible, that at least one representative identifies as a person of color um, and has a commitment to racial equity. Um, particularly if the executive team member is not a person of color. So we know that in, that's not possible in all organizations. Um, and we know that um, part of the power of these conversations is that we're having a um, diverse group of individuals come to the table to be able to build our awareness, grow our awareness by sharing our experiences. Um, and we also ask, like I said, that people make a commitment to at least 90% of the roundtable experiences and meetings. We say 80 to 90%. We know life happens this year in COVID. The cohort managed to really meet that challenge um, and it paid off so much in the trust we were able to build and the work that they were able to do with the consistency of coming once a month. And then we added this um, this year that we ask that there's 
that you do the pre-work of thinking about an internal group of staff that isn't coming to the roundtable, that you as the team who's cut, who is the roundtable team can take back to your organization and say like, let's have monthly meetings so we can process what we learned and we can talk about how we can integrate it into our organization. We can build awareness all together. Um, and so this serves as accountability for you and also supports your learning as, you know, the best way to learn something is to have to prepare to teach it. Um, and so thinking about how you can continue discussions and grow the capacity of your organization. Um, we ask that um, part of that team is one substitute or alternative um, alternate participant who has agreed to come and step in in the event that one of the primary team members um, cannot come. We know life happens, um, but do you have somebody on the bench who's willing to tap in so that there's a consistency of voice and participate, participation from your organization? All right, so the timeline, um, key dates. So the application has been open for a little while. Um, it's due March 26th, so from today, that is one month, um, which we hope is enough time for you to engage with it, to engage some of your people in your organization and answer the questions that we'll go through in just a minute. Um, in the month of April, we will review the applications and reach out for anything we need to clarify or just to build relationships. Um, and then by the end of April, we will select and notify the um, core 12 organizations that will be the cohort. And then by May, we ask that once you're selected, you sign a memorandum of participation and reserve your spot and then pay a deposit in June. And the initial cohort meeting is Friday, July 30th. So then the meetings will be the third Friday of each month through April, 2021. And so it's a 10 month process. Like David said, just this week, we wrapped up our most recent 10 month process. Um, it's incredible that we started that with them in June. It feels like it's been two years <laughs> because of everything in the world, but also because of the depth of relationship we've been able to build um, throughout those 10 meetings. Just two things so, I yeah. wanted to um, add from what you said uh, before, mm -hmm. um, just to clarify on the cross sector, um, and the kind of who is the institution, where we really do mean like all call any institution. We found that to be incredibly helpful and actually a beneficial part of the program. When we did the first one, we were like, hey, should we break these off and only do them in sector by sector? And they were like, no, it's actually really incredible to our innovation to have different types of institutions, organizations, corporations, associations, governmental institutions or quasi-governmental. So that's um, kind of a feature of it. Um, and then the one other thing just to add depth to um, is uh, yes, we do ask the institutions are at least in the awareness stage. And it also is good for people that are in the understanding or transforming stages. Um, we just have that. You've at least done some work um, or made some kind of commitment to this as the kind of floor. Yeah, thank you, David. Truly, and um, all sizes as well. We had an organization of uh, like basically a volunteer board all the way up to US Bank CDC, um, you know, and, and that was really um, amazing learning all, all the way through. Um, with really sometimes surprising insight um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, continues to surprise me um, and deepen the awareness, so it's, it's magic. So here's the round table um, fee schedule. So it depends on the type of organization that you are, um, what your operating or grant making budget is, um, and then within some ranges. And so we, we tried to scale it in a way that, you know, you are, it's, it's three hour sessions, 10 months of the year for uh, two to three participants, as well as um, access for advice from the rescue organization. So um, it's a substantial lift from the team. And so our, our, fee, our fees are set here. But like I said, um, there are scholarships available. We want this to be accessible. And so um, if seeing these numbers makes you panic, please don't hesitate to reach out. We wanna um, figure, figure out a way for, for folks to um, come to the table and do the work. We had um, one, one question in the chat that I just wanted to bring up. Um, someone asked, does the fee cover both reps or is it per rep? Oh, it's per both reps. It's per organization. 
So yeah. um, the, the fee is per organization, two representatives, the 10 monthly meetings, as well as the individualized support um, from FTF on case studies and action plan creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you um, need to ask your organization for professional development per um, per person rather than per organization, then divide it by um, three, really, because it's two people plus the third one, the alternative participant could be helpful. Um, I see a question, how long are the monthly meetings? Um, they're three hours. So from we've been doing from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, that's the beginning of the workday in the mornings. Um, so that's the plan right now. And we're receiving feedback from the most recent cohort. So we'll, we're figuring out the scheduling about that. But we find three hours is sort of the minimum. <laughs> when, when at the end, by the end of each one of the sessions, we're always uh, still hungry, we're continuing to speak to each other. All right, so then in terms of evaluation, we are um, committed to continuous improvement. <laughs> like I just sort of alluded to, my mind's always in evaluation mode. Um, and so the roundtable focuses on um, understanding our impact um, and on both the participants and the institutions, um, as well as how well the program is working throughout and how we can improve implementation, both from cohort to cohort and between sessions. Um, so we use this information. We, we ask you for, um, a, like I said, a baseline and a growth group, um, assessment beginning and the end, as well as reflections at the end of each session. And so that's to hear what, get a, get a pulse on how it's going, how you're doing, and to hear ways that we can improve. Um, and a key part of this too, which we shared in the testimonials, but which the team is really committed, the Ford, the Ferguson team overall is committed to doing is storytelling. So we're doing the work where we also are generating stories about the work and really honest stories about the work. And so we're not trying to paint a rosy picture about that this is all sunshine and fun. We do have joy in the meetings. We try to cultivate a community that um, people um, are excited to come to and work in, but this work is hard. And the more um, transparent and honest we can be about that work through the ways that we evaluate the programs and ask for you to tell your story and your challenges um, throughout it, I think um, the more impactful we can be with that storytelling. So um inviting people to the table and normalizing the messiness of it while um inviting people making it um a lower barrier to entry to start trying things because as a as a region we need to try and telling stories is a big part of that um and so then we ask you questions in the evaluation process to think about how we're impacting um institutions how we're impacting individuals how um how we've done what we say we're gonna do. And so we're committed to that to serve you um, as well, as best as we can. Um, I see a question in the chat, are they in person or virtual or both? We'll begin by virtual. Um, and if something changes, we'll open up to in-person. Um, this year we hit a good stride of um, being digital, being virtual. We figured out some good tools um and maximizing participation and always um improving over time so i'm seeing questions in the chat um that i appreciate a lot basically here we go submit the applications by march 26th um to one of us or to me um and then that we just ask for some basic information and our application questions set you up to um start your case studies which will be the bulk of the work um, in the round table. So um, let's open up to uh, questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand and um, we'll take them out loud. Thanks for engaging the chat as well. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm my computer wasn't working, so I've been doing this on my cell phone, and I'm not. Uh, I don't. I sometimes can't see. Um, mm -hmm. I I sort of missed the part. This is my second um, time listening to this wonderful presentation, and hopefully, will be my second time encouraging my agency to at least submit an application. Um, there was something you had mentioned though when you said working with maybe another agency or another um another institution that does similar work would that mean we would we would 
apply together and then have one person from each of the similar agencies? Or did I did I miss totally misunderstand that? Oh, no, thanks for that question. Um, I think um, it's come up before and we ask you to both apply as your agency because the nature of the curriculum is to think about your own organization, but we encourage you to, to apply together and note that you are coming together as partners. Um, so it would be two applications, two cohorts um, that then come and uh, potentially we can set it up that you work together throughout. There was um, a question. Uh, thanks so much for that, that question, Kelly. Um, we there was one question about uh, virtual um, versus in person. We have uh, plans for this to be kind of virtual first. Um, as the pandemic hit last year, this last cohort was actually entirely virtual, um, which at first, I mean, as as all of us know, was initially a bummer. We really enjoy the in person interaction, but actually opened up some really awesome things that can happen virtually that can't happen as easily in person. So um, it's been really great to kind of master the format in virtual. Um, if things get to the point where public health officials say that it's safe to meet in person, we'll definitely consider that later on in the cohort, but for now we're virtual first. So this is Kelly again, and I uh, just wanted to make sure I have it clear in my head before I present one or two of the options. If, so I'm coming with the, I'm, I work at the International Institute of St. Louis, and if I want to encourage maybe somebody from another immigrant service provider network partner, then I would, I would reach out to them and say, hey, let's do this together, let's both apply. We both apply, we both pay our, our different funding, whatever, whichever funding source they are. And then throughout the cohort, we would potentially be working together. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there are a variety of different ways we try and build um, relationships between institutions. One of the ways is accountability pairs um, that pair together institutions to do some of the work together and kind of offer support structure. So that might be one way that there's um, interaction um, if you note that in your applications. Any other questions? Um, this is Kelly again. I'm, I'm just, I, my mind is so curious. So I apologize for the, all the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious as to why I mean, obviously you have to have a limitation um, and 12 is what I heard in the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be, but I can't do math right now, 24 people in the, um, have you like, how many applications do you receive and what percentage, you know, are, do you receive a hundred applications or are you receiving like 20? Yeah, so this has changed in an in-person world to a virtual world. So in in-person world, our roundtables are actually larger. There were about 20 institutions, sometimes even more than that. Um, and so then it was kind of easier to have a larger group of people in a room and to be able to interact. But when it comes to the virtual space, we really wanted to maintain the like substance and individualized like support. And so in a virtual space, that's why we kind of reduced it closer to around 12 institutions. Um, and we tend to, it, it, it's not, it, it's not like uh, a 6% acceptance rate, um, but we do tend to get, we expect to get maybe 20 um, to 30 applications. Um, so when we think about um, who goes into the cohort, it'll partially be, you know, if there's some pairings, if there's people from multiple sectors to try and bring them together, um, so that's kind of how we'll, we'll approach it. Mm -hmm. And this year too, um, partially because of um, focus and partially because of demand, we created the education focused roundtable as well. So this is for the cross sector cohort, which like we said, um, all types of institutions are, are um, encouraged to apply, including educational institutions of all types. And the um, K-12 focused education cohort is for education specific 
groups, um, all types of institutions from traditional schools um, to sponsoring institutions of charter schools to research institutions who focus on K-12. Um, but that is so that then we can have an additional cohort of eight to 10. So that expands access, but maintains the intimacy of the, um, the relationship building that can happen with limited folks in a digital space. Um, just so, to be clear, so if you're from an education institution, um, please visit the bit.ly that we shared about all the um, offerings and think about which one might be right for you. Um, and I see a question as well in the chat um, about potential conflicts of interest where, and this has come up before, where we have um, funders in the room as well as grantees. We have board members of institutions of, of other organizations that are around. Um, we don't see that as a conflict of interest. We see it as leaning into some tensions um, that have potential uh, great return in leaning into them in a, in, a, in a space that's a brave space that is willing to lean into it and challenge them. Um, and it's also up to the discretion of those institutions as well. So if you're thinking about it and you're, you're seeing um, an organization that you're related to in that way, that might be a good place to start to reach out and say, what do you think about this? Like, could we do this together and, and begin that um, radical collaboration there as a way to um, approach it. And then we take really, really seriously our group agreements around yeah. confidentiality and around protecting the space. Like we take that really seriously to make sure that we're creating a trusting environment. Mm -hmm. um, I see a question from Carissa. Hey, Carissa. Um, are there past participants who are in the nonprofit space? Um, can we share past participants? Yeah, we can name a few of them. Um, we tend to have um, a majority in the nonprofit space, but by no means all. Um, so some examples are we've had some philanthropic institutions um, like the uh, Community Foundation, like United Way. Um, we've also had some civic institutions like the zoo, or like the St. Louis Symphony. We've had some business associations that have been a part of this in the past. And we've also had quasi um, governmental or, uh, institutions kind of like Missouri Sewer District was part of the first uh, round table. So it, it really is kind of like, and we've also had several schools um, that have been part of it in the past. So it, it kind of tends to span. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well as I, I referenced US Bank CDC, right? So like huge um, private institutions as well. Um, and let's see about how decisions are made about which organizations are accepted. Um, so no, you didn't, the question was, did I miss it? No, we didn't go into detail about that. Um, and part of that is that um, we have been in the past, we've been you know, building relationship with folks. And then the way we select is based on the um, completeness of the application and willingness to engage, as well as creating a cohort that is cross-sector. So we think about balance. Um, and so it's been iterative as folks have come to the table. Um, and so I think that's um, development of a um, rubric beyond evaluating the elements of the application um, isn't something we've done yet. And part of that has been to stay flexible to being um, open and inclusive so that we don't be so rigid that we, um, we stop being inclusive, but we think about how thoroughly you answer the questions. We think about how willing you are um, and sound to, to come to the table and bring back what you're learning um, into your organization. And we think about creating um, the cohort that's most um, rounded in terms of cross-sector access to different parts of, of uh, changing St. Louis. We have a question from Constance. How frequent are the roundtable cycles if not accepted to this one? Um, so uh, historically, we've done them once a year. Um, and we're at this point starting to expand. So you'll see this year we're doing two roundtables, that education-focused one, and then this cross-sector cohort. Um, that'll be all that we have for this year, starting this year. But in the future, um, we are thinking uh, intently about, about growing the number of roundtables. So um, beginning next year around, around this time, there would be information about future, future cycles. Mm -hmm. um, and a question about budgeting for um, the percentage of the fee of the deposit is due in June. So um, we, do, we will accept the full 
be if that's easier for your um, for your budget folks. But um, in the past, we've done half and half. So we asked for half of it in June, half of it in July. Um, and reach out if that's something that is a barrier. Um, we, we've done case by case as well. Yeah, we've created individualized like pay schedules for different institutions depending on their their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how many institutions between the two sets of cohorts have gone through this? Um, and what do you think is the tipping point in terms of transforming the region? Oh, question, what question? <laughs> um, total, I'm counting across the different cohorts. Yes. About 35 across the like one and one and a half across two was an additional 10 counting the newcomers, right? Plus, well, it was 12 organizations, so 24 people. Yeah, but some of them were in the first cohort. Oh, that's true. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking about 40 to 45 total have been through, institutions have been through the round table, and that would be um, about um, 90 people um, have gone through it. Uh, so yeah, it's been a really incredible group. Um, tipping point in, ter in terms of transforming the region. Um, I think we have already seen like institutions that have been part of the round table. Again, not just because of the round table though we do think this is an incredibly effective tool. Um, but we have seen those institutions invest following the round table in a variety of uh, different ways to bring along their sector in this work. So, you know, US Bank CDC has been doing a lot of work to, to bring other CDCs along the way um, and, and across, the, across the spectrum, Sigan Montessori School uh, and on and on. And so, uh, yeah, we have broader ideas about tipping points in our overall racial equity capacity building strategy that involves um, something that we want to get towards, which is a uh, two-year cohort model where um, you become part of an internal ass uh, initial assessment. You get placed with targeted interventions that are fourth person and outside of fourth person, and then exit after two years with a set of accomplishments achieved. Um, but we think the tipping point um, will be once we actually have a larger cohort of institutions like that movement strategy theory that it's you know in order to start a movement you need three percent of people on board initially and then the next big tipping point is around the like 15 to 20 percent um uh space to have the tension and pressure needed to to transform a region so those are kind of the percentages that we're aiming at great question and let's see, we have, do you ever have all institutions meet up or do a review or do an annual update? That's a great question. So in terms of all institutions um, who have gone through it, meeting up cross cohort. Um, in the future, yeah, there will be, in, in the past, it's been kind of like, we have an end of year kind of get together. But. Mm -hmm. And um, seeds of that are working up a, a, a positive outcome of the being in the digital space is that we've had to think about digital tools to keep people um, in touch and engaged. And so we started a Slack channel that we'll build that you can join um, of folks who've gone through it, folks who are going through it, um, thinking about ways that we can do reunions as well as some deeper evaluation tools and that storytelling piece of it as well. I have. Um, lots of ideas about how we can follow up with participants who've gone through it to really track um, ways that it has planted seeds that have continued to grow that we can't see in just 10 months, but that take longer. Um, and so we're thinking we're thinking about that long-term and are building our own capacity to do so as we go. Um, all right, I see you. Kelly with your hand up. Um, thank you. And I think this will probably be my last question, but um, I'm really impressed with this work and I'm, I'm trying to, think in my brain how I can explain to my coworkers the importance of this training, not in the lens of DE and I, like you mentioned. So what kind of words of advice do you have for me in terms of making the case that this 
is is work alongside of what our already D and D E and I work might be, but that this is just as important work. So I'm I'm just trying to figure out how I can put this sort of in the forefront of my coworkers' minds be, because they're gonna I I. I already was kind of already approached like, oh, we're already doing this work. And it's like, well, we're not really doing this work. So what's your advice that I could go back to and really kind of put this at the forefront of their minds? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, we talk a lot about both and thinking in the, in the round table. So while, um, like we said, we are not a diversity, equity, inclusion trainer, so we're not a replacement for that type of training with and capacity building among your staff, um, that, that we are approaching it with a system change lens. So it's about um, how do you do, continue to do the work you're doing to shift the culture in your institution by um, building buy-in with more people and building that individual awareness on the individual level and then come to the round table to think about as an institution, how can you be changing systems so that you're, you're shifting culture so that when you change policy, that policy is likely to be implemented, adopted, actually utilized versus changing policy too fast and people make people feeling like it's being imposed on them or forced into it. And then you're more likely to get pushed back. Um, what do you think, David? Um, if you go back to slide 20, the um, path to racial equity, um, this is how we really think about it, is that mostly what the region uh, does and have been doing up to the killing of Michael Brown is like awareness work, right? We were talking about diversity, inclusion, tolerance, like cultural competency, maybe getting to talking about race as like a social construct, but often things would kind of get stuck at, at, at awareness. We, we often find that in a lot of institutions, when you're doing traditional DEI work, there can kind of be this um, stopping point where is it getting towards the structural institutional ways that systemic racism is built into the way we do business in St. Louis. And so we think all squares, uh, all the rectangles on this chart are important. And Ford through Ferguson's uh, uh, goal our, our mission here is to get the region at that regional transformation stage. Like that top right corner is where we're really driving towards. And so this racial equity roundtable and our other, um, our, our other um, offerings are really about how do ind individuals institute, uh, influence their institutions to have a strong analysis of how they continue to perpetuate racial inequity so that your institution can be an active, part of transforming the region towards uh, equity and to doing that in a networked way. And so that's kind of how we talk about it being different. You know, it's it's not just awareness building, diversity, equity, inclusion trainings. We're really um, oriented towards like transformation and systems change towards uh, racially equitable St. Louis. Mm -hmm. 